Here, suppose that you are B, and you want here to get the traffic through AZ. How will you do that? So you want that people that reach you send you the traffic through SD instead of going through directly through ISX because, for example, here the path is uh, has very few bandwidth, and so it's better to use the overlinks, which will have more bandwidth. How can you do that? Here, these two links, I to Z and Z to B, have more bandwidth than I to B, uh, Y to B. So, how can we tell the world not to use this, but this, which is longer in terms of S? Lower metric, yes. Which kind of metrics we can use? Can we use local pref? No. I don't know bandwidth. I'm doing politics. So I don't know about technical things. But of course I have to match politics to reality. But I I have no way to tell reality. I just have my politics metrics, which is cost, uh, we saw with MED, uh, multi-exit discriminator, or cost with, uh, internally with local pref, or other things. So how can we make traffic not going through, uh, through rattling? Of course, when everything works fine, here. And if it doesn't work fine here, because this line is broken, some misconfiguration in Z makes that connectivity is broken, or the line between I, Y and Z are, is also broken. So it's what I'm going to do here, for example. I'm sending here a prefix beta, and I tell the rest of the world that if I go through that link, the cost will be B, B, B. So it's three I's. And here I just send it with one B. So when it arrives here, I have beta and it's just half the ice path and the ice path is Z and B. So now we take the best one and we continue to announce the best one to the rest of the world. So this one is not the best, the with the three B because it's longer than this one. So now I say to the rest of the world, to reach prefix beta, okay, I am ISX, but here is the ice path, Y, Z, and B. Okay, so this way, I make all the traffic goes to SY, but in SY, I will prefer to send it to SZ than to send it directly to SB. So this is one uh, way of doing traffic engineer because now I am changing the way I can send packets on the network. So for example, you know that this link is overloaded and you want to share your both links. So maybe you can send some prefix directly that way on some over using the overlink. So the one you want to go directly to Y, you will just send B. And here B will be better than the other path, which will be B and Z. So the traffic will go directly. And other part of your prefixes will go on the, the other line. And this way you can load balance between both lines. So this is uh, one possibility. And we are going now to, to see another trick that can be used to control some remote AS behaviors. So this is something which is 
more complex to, to do. We're going to see it. So, initially, it was just to take, to talk with the other S, like this, and you add some communi co community attributes that were used to link things. Because when you have a prefix, or when you when you are site, you receive prefix from an ASP. And then on your router, you have to write configuration to process this prefix. Do I like them? Do I don't like them? Do I filter them? Etc. Etc. So here you are going to put some processing some code. When you are configuring your Cisco, it's like writing a program to say, what do you do with these prefixes? Or with uh, this path? So one possibility is to write the code and say, if the prefix is alpha, I do that. If the prefix is beta, I do that. If the prefix is gamma, I do that. But if you are doing the same thing, it's stupid to, to add each time uh, the same processing. And of course, if you change something here, you will have to change it on the other one. So, what we can do is that the entry of your network, we will add a prefix, which is a community attribute to the prefi this prefix. And we will add the same community attribute to all the prefixes. And when we have done that, we can say that if this prefix has this community attribute, then we will do that. So this way, first step is to tag the community attribute and then to de de declare the processing for this community attribute. So I don't know if you notice it, but when we look at import from the Geon network, you remember? Geon network is a network that manages research and education in Europe. So what does it, you see here? For example, when I import something from AS378, what is my action first is to append a community attribute. Here you have community append. And I add a community attribute, which is composed of two things. One thing is the IS number of my community, of my uh, IS. So here it's the IS number of Jean. And then I have a value. And this value is, has only a local meaning to Jean. And here what it says, it says that I am opening community attribute 155. And you see that for plenty of ISs, we tag the same community attribute. So it means that after that, we will develop uh, a process that say, for example, community attributes is this one, and I will develop, a, I will filter, I will process internally all these routes the same way. So if I add a new provider to my configuration, I don't have to do a lot of change in my router. The only thing I have to do is to tag with the same attribute. And here, for example, in the remarks, you see that this community attribute is Jean, Jean Extra. This one is Infonet, etc., etc. So you have declaration of your commu communities, mean a group of ISs which will have the same behavior, the same processing inside your router. So this is one possibility. It means that you tag internally your route when your packet and your announcement enter, and then you declare processing. You have some default behavior that has been done, has been defined. 
So, for example, if you use this well-known community entry attribute, it means, for example, I tell you that this pre I tell you this prefix to you because you can use it, but don't export it to another AS. So here, you tell something to an AS, but this AS cannot send it after. So it's just him, this AS, that can talk with you or send packets, but not the other AS that are behind this AS. So this is one possibility. Another thing is that you see in that example, I told you that when a packet arrives, I tag it at the arrival. Sorry, when an announcement arrives, I tag it at the arrival. And then I define a process. We can imagine something much complex. And for example, I have my AS graph. And here, this AS will make an announcement. So here I'm, for example, AS3. And here, I announce my prefix beta, and I add to my prefix beta a community attribute that will be 3 and some value, v. What does it mean? It means that when the, pack, the announcement reach as 3, so we will have announcement of prefix beta, this, of course, will have a nice path, but it will carry also a community attribute, which is 3 and value v. So 3 here is the size number. It means that this size number may take into account the value v and will do a special process for this announcement. And value v is something purely, purely, purely local but will help you to configure how IS3 will announce its route to its neighbors. So this way you can change the behavior of one IS somewhere in the world. So we are going to, to see an example. For example, here, if we come back to uh, example to see our prefix, so here, I have two S paths, and here I have some community attribute. So we can go on this website. You see that this community attribute is come from this S number 1273. So we can have a look to this website, www.cableandwireless.net. So, I am here on Cable and Wireless website, and you see that this is not a commercial page. A user or a normal user will not go this because it's not very nice, there is no flash, there is no, uh, we are the best in the world, by uh, Cable and Wireless. This is not for that, but here you have some information regarding the way Cable and Wireless tag the, the attribute. So here you see the new implementation allow five digit strings following 12, 30, 70, 30, 73, which is the highest number of Kerbal and wireless. And then it says you have x, 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 x. So what they say after that? It says that in fact you have things that, for example, be one, two, or three that say this is the root from a customer, this is a route from, from a peer, or for upstream. Or, you have, sorry, we don't see it very well. I can go here. So here, the first letter will tell you how do I learn about this prefix. And then I have R, and R is a region. So if it's one, it's US. If it's two, is Europe, etc., etc. And then 
I have the country code. So for example, if it comes from France, I don't know if I will find it because uh, I don't know the order. France here, it will be 250. So it means that I will have two for Europe and 50 for the country code in Europe. So this is totally, purely local way to represent the information. This is defined by cable and wireless. If you take level three, it will be a totally different way to represent the information. So here you have the list of countries. So it means that when you look at the announcement, so when you look at the announcement here, one, so it's a customer, two is Europe, and 250 is France. So now I know by reading this announcement in a BGP table somewhere, that this, learn, this route has been learned by the cable and wireless by France. And it's a customer of cable and wireless. It's not appearing. It means that it's not come from another ISP, but directly from a customer of cable and wireless. So this helped me. If you remember that we have a lot of difficulty in the internet when something is wrong, because we don't know if it's a forwarding path or back return path that doesn't work, or it's the announcement, BGP announcement that doesn't work for you or for the other one. So we have you have to debug this kind of situation. For example, one customer say, okay, I cannot join, I cannot ping your site in France. So what do you say? Okay, it's a problem of forwarding or a problem of router announcement. So you can say, okay, I am going to see on, the, on some places and here I have things that help me to debug the information, how this prefix was learned. And if I know the code here, it tells me some information regarding this uh, prefix and how level three learn it. So, this is one behavior. Another behavior is, so just here is tagging just for information to help you to debug. The other thing is tagging to put control. And here you see, I, I have some customer that complains because when they want to reach my website, they got a very, very bad quality. And so I look at the BGP announcement and I notice that this customer is in A. So he has a bad quality because he is using this path here. And this path, so between A and Y, and this path has, is overloaded. So I would like the traffic to go to X because I know that I have more bandwidth here. I cannot do it directly because I send announcement here, but this announcement will be filtered by Y and only the best one will succeed. So what can I do? I can read on my provider Y web page that this provider has developed some community attribute. And for example, he say, OK, see if you are using Y colon 1 as a community attribute, it means that I will expand the, uh, my IS number three times on that path. If you are using a community attribute Y2, I will expand the community attribute on that path. So here, the answer is very simple. What will I do? I will do my announcement, and I will add a community attribute to say, expand the root here, the path here, sorry, on A, on Y to A. So when I do that, I will have Y, 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 Y. So here I send this community attribute, and here, ISY will change its behavior and will expand of, toward A, the community attribute, uh, the IS path, and you will have YYZB. 
By doing that, this path, this link between I and Y, will not be chosen. And instead, we will ch choose the other one because the other one has a better quality. So it means that here you see, I have totally changed the traffic. Normally, if I was using default parameter, the traffic between A and B will be only through ISY. Because we are using the shorted path, or the shorted IS path, sorry, and here is the shorted IS path. But by expanding my prefixes, I have selected Z. So I go, the traffic go to Z now, to go to me. And by using community string, community attribute, I have told also this IS to change the route, and now I am going through, through ISX. So, you see that I can change the way the route goes on the internet, and sometimes it's very useful, either because I have some bogus routes, and my packet disappear, my announcement disappear from the internet, or it's going through bad quality links, and I can arrange things. So you see that you can do a lot of powerful things using the ISPAS on community attribute. So for example, I have some example of things you can do using community attribute. And for example, here uh, I say prepend x time to select peer. So here I have the command I can send to cable and wireless to tell if I'm sending a prefix and this prefix goes through cable and wireless, I can tell a lot of things. Here I have the IS number, but IS numbers are too big. So here you have the smallest number that refer to IS number. And you can say, for example, when I am peering with Swisscom, you have to add, expand three times the IS of cable and wireless in the prefix path, because I don't want you to send the traffic through Swisscom, because I have bad qualities. So here, is defined, and each provider will have its own syntax to define this kind of fix. So, now, there is a strange value, and it's value 600, uh, 666. So you know what this number means? Yeah, it's a beast is because, for example, you are under attack. So, you, you have a website. You have some IS. You are connected. And here, you have cable and wireless website. And of course, you have overpeering with other things, so you have a graph. But you see that your website is attacked by a lot of traffic that goes through cable and OLS and overload your website so nobody can see it again because there is too much traffic. So maybe one solution would be to say, OK, I stop my to announce the prefix of my website. So this is one, one solution that is not the best solution because you block your website for everybody. So maybe you can use uh, a way to say, okay, so I forget, I, I don't announce this to cable and wireless. It will have no effect because since it's a graph, you will find another path. So, what do you do? You have your prefix beta of your website, which is in, under attack. So, you announce it now with the prefix, so with the community attribute of cable and wireless. So, 1273, and you put 666 to your prefix beta. So, this will arrive on this side. There has no effect on the overall ISP because it's not the, IS, 
this is not the RIS number. So only cable and wireless will process this community attribute and we'll see 666. So what will do cable and wireless is to trash the traffic and remove it from the internet. So it means that here you have lost connectivity with people that are connected to cable and wireless. But you suppress the cause of or the consequence of the denial of service attack. So this way, of course, people, customer that want to accept your web website, normal customer that want to accept uh, ac uh, access to your website using cable and wireless, will not be able to do it because you have lose the connectivity so cable and wireless. But it means that if other customer that go from another IS will be able to access to your website. So this is a way to protect you against denial of service attack, but it's not the best way, just a way to cure it instantaneously. And it says is that when you have done that with the announcement, then you, you have to open a ticket to manage, that to help to ask uh, cable and wireless to manage and to see why there was this denial of service attack. So it's some uh, some way to to play with uh, attributes. Okay, so let's over attributes that are useful is aggregation. So, for example, here I look at two prefixes from Telecom and Bro Telecom Broadline. The first one, 192.108.119, is a prefix that was given to Telecom Broadline before 1993. So, this prefix is a classful prefix and belongs to, France, to Telecom Broadline. So, here there is no aggregation. So if I go to a server, so here I am in Canada, I look into the BGP routing table in uh, this server, what do I see? I see that the prefix is intact. So I have a slash 24 at Telecom Bretagne, and here it's a slash 24 that is stored in this router memory. In fact, all, router memory, all routers on Earth will take this entry, will have this entry. Now Telecom Britain has an, another slash 24 prefix is 193.52.74. But this prefix doesn't belong to Telecom Britain. This prefix belongs to Renater. And what do we see in the routing table in Canada is that you don't have this prefix but you have an aggregation. And in fact, here you have a slash 16. It means that here, Renater is doing aggregation. Aggregate all the prefixes for, from his customer and announce only one prefix. So it's a way to reduce the size of the routing table. So, and when Renater is doing aggregation, you will see here an attribute that says that it has been aggregated by this uh, S, so 2200, you know that it's Renater, and here you have the router that made the aggregation. Okay? So, now, the nicest attribute of BGP is next up. Next up is very, has a very funny, funny behavior and it's very helpful to do a lot of things on the internet. So we are going to see how it works. So behavior are totally different if you are in BGP, eBGP, external BGP or internal BGP 
or even here if you have the red topology here. So we are going to see in this scheme the, the different behaviors. So here I want to, I have prefix epsilon and I want to announce prefix epsilon to ASB, so the green one. So here it will be easy. I have my IGP that connect, collect all the prefixes. I learned about this prefix. And so I send it using EBGP between R1 and R2. And my next stop, so R1 is announcing this prefix. And it says there is a prefix called epsilon. And the next stop is, and it will put the IP address of its uh, interface. So R2 will put in its fib to reach epsilon, I have to send it to alpha.1. And this will be, uh, the, so the fib is the lowest layer. So when you will receive something for epsilon, then we know that you have to send it on this link to that interface. So here it's the normal definition of next stop is one, or it's the next stop, the BGP definition of next stop is the same as the FIB definition of next stop. So it's really where I can send the information. And here it's possible because we are on the same link. It's eBGP, external BGP, and we have a direct link between these two routers. Now, when I look internally, I have this prefix epsilon, and I have to send it internally using IBGP, internal BGP, to router R3. So what do I do? I do the same as R1 did. It says that there is a prefix called epsilon, and I put into next stop the IP address on which I am sending the information. So here I will put beta 1. Can I put beta 1 in the fib of R3? So here I cannot join directly beta 1. Because here I am in internal inside my AS autonomous system, and here I have some routers here. So we are not on the same prefix. So here, if I was putting beta 1 in my fib, it's not a next stop, so I cannot join it. So I have to put a prefix I can join, a network router I can join. So how we can do that? You remember that we have an IGP and on this IGP, so if I look at my shorted path 3 for R3, I have I have compute something and here I know that I join prefix delta. Okay? So what do I do then? I look at my next stop in so the first level of my tree and here I will say that to send to prefix delta here that is contained in my BGP next stop I will have to use my FIB next stop which is delta 1 Okay, so I receive a BGP message that say you have to send it to delta. Sorry, it's the opposite. You have to send it to beta. So I look in my topology tree, or if it's more complex with uh, area, I have to look at the announcement router that made the announcement for another area. But let's say that we are in the single area. So I look, I know that I have to join prefix beta. I look on my tree, where is prefix beta? 
and I find the fib next stop, which is the first level of my tree. So I have to send it to delta 1. And what will I put in my fib next stop is delta 1 here. So you see that, in that case, the BGP network, the BGP next stop, is not the fib next stop. But the BGP next stop helps, helps me to find the FIB next stop using the topology tree. Okay? So that's something important to have in mind is that when we have a next stop in BGP is not what we will put in the FIB. Uh, delta is delta one, 2 is here and delta 1 will be here. I forget to, to write it. OK? So now, let's, last behavior. And here, so until now, it was something logic, things we have already seen, but we go in uh, more detail. Now, what is important to, to, to see here is, so, we can see that on exam this example, and I will show you what we, we have at Telecom Brotide. So here, suppose that we have a root, router R5 that want to announce the prefix phi. So here, router R5, we have a BGP peering, IBGP peering, with R4. And so what do you put here? You say alpha, no, phi, sorry. And the next stop is gamma 1. So here it's logic. You know, you learn about a prefix, and you tell to your next, uh, to the, the other router, where you are doing BGP, that there's a prefix phi, and I can, you can access to the prefix phi. And now router F4 will send a BGP announcement to router R3. But what we are doing here, we are not going to change the next stop value. Normally, if we take all we have seen before, we put the address, the IP address of the, the prefix, we make the announcement. So here it will be gamma.2. But since gamma.2 and gamma.1 are on the same prefix, I will continue to keep gamma.1. So it means that now packets that goes to R5 will go directly to R5 without crossing R4. Okay, so this is an optimization because otherwise R4 will have sent it again on that link to R5. So it's better to send it directly. So I will show you that on another example we, we have in Telecom Bretagne. But what's the interest of this? What is the big difference on what we have seen until now? Is that now the routing path is different from the forwarding path. And with BGP, we are going to do, we are going to do that. Very, it's a very common behavior. When you are in the IGP, you remember, we check if we have bidirectional path because we, if we, I send an announcement, I want to receive the traffic on the other way. So it means that my routing path and my forwarding path are the same in both directions, but they are the same. Now I can send BGP message to other devices and these devices like R4 will never see the traffic. They just see the routing information, but not, they will not forward the traffic. So it will be very helpful. helpful. We will see why in a few moments. So what does it mean right now? For example, in Telecom Bretagne, we have our production network. So our production network is handled by a router. And this router can peer with Renater. 
And so Renater router has been configured to accept only BGP connection with our production network. In fact, here we have a, a link, an Ethernet link between these two routers, and we have a slash 29. Slash 29 means that we have four bits, three bits, sorry, to number things. We don't use things with only bits equal to zero, and we don't use all the bits equal to one, but we have C, six remaining possible values. One of them is, using, is used by our router, and this value is known by Renate. Now, we have another network. It's an experimental network for our lab. And here, we have a router, and we want to announce the prefix like 192, 108, 119, that is our test network, to Renater, to have routing. I cannot do it directly, because Renater will not accept, is not configured to accept my peering. So, I can go only to our production router, and this production router is, is configured to accept the peering. So, I send the announcement to, uh, for this prefix, this lab prefix, and then it is sent to Renater. But since we are on the same link, when Renater will send me traffic, this router will not have changed the next stop, and the traffic will be directly sent to this uh, lab router, and will not go through the production router. Okay, so you see, I change the path, as in this example, we change the path, the announcement will go one way, and the traffic will go another way. And this will be very useful for plenty of things that we will see in the future. Last, last uh, part about this, and if you understand that, you have understood everything to uh, BGP. It's something called synchronization. So suppose that here we are going to see the old pass. I have a prefix epsilon. So I send this prefix epsilon using BGP announcement to R1. Then I have a TCP connection between R1 and R3. And I send the information concerning epsilon. So in the fib here, I have to reach epsilon, you have to send it to delta dot one. And then I send this prefix, the same way as between R1 and R2, R3 send it to R4. Now, suppose that R4 or any router wants to send traffic to epsilon. What happens? This router knows about epsilon and in its fib, it says that if you want to reach epsilon, you have to send it to gamma dot one. So it's here. Now I am here, and my routing table says, okay, you have to send it to delta one. And what happens here? What will do delta one? Source address, someone you don't know, destination address, epsilon dot one. And here, there is nothing in this router fib about epsilon. So what will it do? It will issue backward to the source an ICMP message that says, I don't know this prefix. So, that's the problem. And why do we have that? It's because maybe we went too fast, because BGP, it's a TCP connection, you send the information, and then you send it to the the other BGP connection. And so it can be very quick. You can forward the information very quickly. But here, this router has also to inform P router that there is a prefix epsilon. And this is done using IGP. 
So your OSPF, for example. And here, maybe you are not going to process this as fast as BGP. So you have some timer to avoid, because you remember that uh, shorted path 3 is a very complex process. So you are not going to do it each time you have a new announcement. You will try to buffer the announcement before running your algorithm. So it means that you have some timer, and the announcement for Epsilon will not be sent in IGP plan as fast as in the BGP plan. So what does it mean, synchronization? It means that I will wait. So I have received here the information concerning Epsilon, but I don't receive it from my IGP. So I will not tell the other that this prefix exists because I'm not sure that inside my own network all everybody is ready to carry things to Epsilon. So I will wait that the IGP has send as configure his path toward Epsilon. And when I will have received the announcement from my IGP, then I will be able to send my BGP announcement. So it's why we call a synchronization, because we synchronize the sending of a prefix on BGP on the receiving of this prefix at the IGP level. And then, everybody knows about prefix epsilon, so the packet can be forward to the destination. OK, so that's some possibility with IGP. What, and here I am putting inside my network the complexity of the world. So this afternoon we will see that there is other way to do that. And avoid to do synchronization, avoid to put all the routes on this router because otherwise this router has to know a lot of prefixes and it will create a lot of IGP traffic. So I want to keep my IGP as simple as possible. And we will see this afternoon how we can do that with BGP. So now, when a BGP router receives a BGP announcement, he has to check thing and will reject the announcement if, for example, he, has, he sees his own number in the path. So remember, receiving your number means that the announcement comes from over a site and go back to you. So there is a loop, and so you don't have to take care into account because to take this into account because it's uh, it's coming back to you by another path. Other thing is that you have a next stop that you cannot reach. So that's a problem. For example. In the previous example, if I don't have in my announcement here I have beta.1, but if I don't know how to reach beta, then I cannot accept this prefix. Otherwise, I will create a black hole because I will announce, continue to propagate the information and say, OK, you can send me traffic to epsilon, but when I will receive traffic to epsilon, then I will not know how to process it, because I don't know where is the next stop. So in that case also, I refuse to take into account that. So this is two automatic policies. And then you have user policies, or ISP policies. For example, he said, I don't want to talk with this guy. I don't accept his traffic. So in that case, you can specify some rules and you can filter the information either using or on the prefix or on the IS path. For example, you say, I accept things from Renater, but if you receive things from a customer of Renater, then you will refuse this thing because you just accept things that initiate, are initiated from Renater. So here you will define your policy and it's what we saw in the WIS database. I will import things coming from this IS 
or this ice path, but not from this other ice path. So here it's your policy that you, you will put there. And then it depends on your uh, router. Cisco and Juniper, for example, have different behavior to manage BGP information. So first thing you, you look when you accept an announcement, so you have a local weight. And if you put this local, if you have the highest local weight, you will accept. If they are equal, then you look at local pref. So we saw local pref, you add this in an announcement. And if you are the sender of the highest announcement, then it's you win. Then you have ice pass. So you see that local pref is more important than the ice pass. The ice pass is the default policy. But after that, you can look uh, at the prefix of the router that sends you the information. And you can filter it. Then you can look at the origin, which is not very useful because now the origin is always IGP. Then you can have something on MED. Then you will privilege external path to internal path. Because if you privilege into external path, the traffic will leave directly. If internal path, it will stay in your domain. So it's better to, to leave it out. Then, if you have internally, but you have different routers, then you will look at the cost to reach that router. And you will select the best one, etc., etc. So you see that you have a complex process to select a BGP announcement. So, now, with BGP, we have a problem when we have a very large network because we have, some, we have to establish IBGP peering with all the P. Why we have to do that? is because in normal BGP we don't have when we are doing external BGP we have the ice path that allow you to detect a loop because if an announcement comes back with the same ice number you know that the information is coming back to you but here we have we are in the yes the same ice number so since we are in the same ice number we cannot make the difference between something that loops or something that is announced by this one. I cannot put the S number to, to, this, to define this. So, to avoid any problem, when I am sending something in IGP, for example, this router send an IBGP, sorry, when I'm sending an IBGP message to another router, then this router cannot send it again. So I just give it to that router. So to make all the router aware about this information means that I have to send it one by one to all the other routers. Which is very difficult to manage. Because if I'm doing that, I add a new router here, I have to reconfigure all the routers to make a peering with me. So it's a lot of configuration. It's also a lot of traffic because if I am learning 350,000 routes from this BGP router, then I have to send this 350,000 route to all my PE. So it will generate a lot of traffic. And we go again in the problem we saw with MPLS. It means that physically I may have only one link to a P router. So it means that on that link, I will copy n time the same information. So what we would like to do is to reduce the number of peering inside the domain. And we, we have two possibilities. One is called, use what we call confederation. So what does it mean? 
It means that I split my eyes into smaller eyes. But these smaller eyes will have private numbers. So when I will leave, I will remove this. But now, since I consider this private ISs as ISs, it means that I have to do EBGP outside of my IS and IBGP, internal BGP, only inside of my IS. And the number of devices will be smaller. Since the number of links is n square, here I will have less uh, connection. For example, in the gray one on the left, I will have only three IBGP connections because I have only three routers. And then I will do EBGP between my IS, my private IS, and the blue one. And here I don't have to have a full mesh. I can have only some EBGP link on, because when I will learn something from here, I will propagate it to the other one. So, in the blue one, I can have I will have a full mesh, but the full mesh here is composed only of uh, six links, six peering, etc., etc. The other advantage is, for example, during a migration, I can have some ISs, uh, private ISs, where I will run one IGP, for example, IS to IS, and other ISPs or uh, private uh, IS, where I will run OSPF, for example. So I have, I don't need to have something. And, uh, only one IGP. So this is one, uh, one solution to solve the problem and when I receive an announcement, so I use IBGP here in my gray IS, so I, I send the information to all my other PE in my private IS, then I'm sending in using I EBGP, I'm sending here, I'm sending to all the other one, here in the blue one, so I'm sending to the three over PE, etc., etc. So the prefix arrives to the destination, and when I sending outside, I remove the private IS path. So from the over ISs, they will see only ISY, and they will not see that I have divided this into private ISs. So this is one way that is called confederation. The other way is to do the same as I did with IS pass, but take instead a router pass inside my IS, and this router pass will allow me to avoid loops inside my area. So it's what we have here, for example, and I will put what I will call root reflectors. And a root reflector is something that takes the information, so IBGP, but the root reflector is allowed, allowed, allowed to send the information to over equipment PE using IBGP. So here, I have the right, when I receive something, to send it to the other one, which is totally forbidden if you are not a root reflector. So here, the root reflector will be a kind of hub. You send the information, and then I resend it to the other edges. So what does it mean? It means that, for example, if I'm sending something with next stop, the root reflector will not change the next stop. It will just copy it, for example, to R6. And so this way, R6 knows that he has to forward the traffic to uh, R9. But it will be R10, the root reflector will be totally transparent. So it means that here our BGP traffic will go to the root reflector, but the forwarding traffic will, don't, will not go to the root reflector. So here we are also changing the way we manage prefix announcement and the way we are doing routing on our network. So of course there is a problem if your root reflector fails 
then you are losing connectivity inside your network because root refactor is a single point of failure. So to avoid this, that you can put several root refactors. But if you put several root refactors, you have a risk of a loop between these two root refactors. So that's why when you do that, you will add some attributes. So this is not transitive attribute. They will stay only in your IS. But this way you can only send, you will not resend the information. You will not do a ping pong between these two root refactors. And this way you can limit the number of appearing in your area. So for example, here you see that I have routers that are appearing with root reflectors, but I may have also routers that doesn't appear with root reflector. And in that case, for example, it's the case for R4, R5. So this one has to do a full mesh peering. So to talk with the other one. But it works. So this way I have less connection than in the first case. And the other advantage is that I concentrate the information on one point. So it's easier for me to know how BGP is managed on my network because I centralize information on my root refactor. And the root refactor doesn't have to be on high-speed links because I will, the root refactor will nev may never, re nev never forward packets. They will just forward BGP announcement. So it's a very small traffic compared to the for traffic you are forwarding. So we will see when we will go to some routers in the, that we may find some routers with only one interface. Because this router is a root reflector and is just received peering from other router on the network and concentrate the information. Okay, so Let's have a look to the network architecture. So here, you, you see that the routing, the network architecture, if you have an ISP here, or you are connecting your customer, what you will have, it's P routers, but some of them will call point of presence, because it's all of you to catch the traffic for customer or from other ISPs. So this way you collect the traffic from an area and then you can exchange the traffic with other providers. And this will be totally hierarchical. Sometimes it's not good to be hierarchical. For example, suppose that you have two ISP in Mexico. So one ISP is in Mexico City and get a lot of traffic from its customers. And you have a competitor in Mexico that does the same and collect a lot of traffic from its customer. So you are in Mexico and then of course you are interconnected to, for example, one provider in the US. So our customer from ESP1 can reach a customer from ESP2. If we keep the hierarchical structure of the internet, it means that your packet goes to the US and come back to the other ISP and then here you will reach the other one. It may be stupid because here when you do peering with another ASP, you pay for the traffic. Or if you do transit sorry, with an ASP, you pay for the traffic. So here you pay, you send your traffic to the US, a lot of traffic to the US, and this traffic doesn't have to go to the US. This traffic can stay local. Okay? So for you it's cheaper to go to a neutral place 
and exchange local traffic with the other ASP. Because you will not pay this line between Mexico and US, and so you will reduce also your traffic here, so your interconnection cost here will be cheaper. So, there is a benefit to exchange locally the traffic. It's what we call a global inter-exchange space. So, what is uh, this kind of things? A global inter-exchange space, a GIX, it's some a neutral place where you have just power and you come with your lease line you put your router you connect it to a switch and on the other ISP do the same he come with his lease line and his router and put it on the switch and they can exchange traffic so it can looks like this it means that in this neutral place you have the different ISPs that will exchange the traffic. So here you will have EBGP because here you have a nice number, it's the ISP1, another IS number for ISP2, another IS number for ISP3, etc. etc. So here the traffic is EBGP. So for example, you each ISP has its own politic. So it will establish peering with other ISP. So in that case, for example, ISP3 has a prefix, announce it to ISP1 with a prefix, and the politic of ISP1 is to send this prefix to ISP4. Okay? How will be the traffic between ISP4 and ISP3? Which path will be taken by the traffic. Will the traffic go to ISP1? Will it go through ISP1? I have traffic from ISP4 to ISP3. The announcement goes through ISP1. But they share the same link. They are on the same prefix. So here we will not change the prefix and so ISP4 will be able to send directly the traffic to ISP3. Okay? So when you will be in REN, one of the practical will be to play this role. So each of you will be a different ISP and you will have to take some agreement to, um, to be sure that you can send traffic from one point to another. So this is one, one possibility. Of course, sometimes it's not very clear because here I have only one, each of the ISP is doing his own peering strategy with other ISPs. So what we can do is, for example, to, to put another device and ask all the ISP to do peering with a special router called a root server. And this rule server will implement the strategy, the politics of the ISPs. So, we have two solutions. One is to give the root path, the root password of the root server to all the ISP and ask them to configure their politic in a central way on this root server. Do you believe that it's a good solution? Can every ISP go on this router and configure their politics by themselves? So normally not because they are competitors. And sometimes, just by mistake, we can erase one competitor configuration or make a small mistake that makes that all the traffic is going through a very small uh, throughput link and so the other ISP will have a very bad quality. So of course it's impossible to ask all the competitors to collaborate to make this thing work. So in fact we have to populate the routing table here 
in another way. How we can do that? Remember when you have your Ruiz database, you put your strategy. Import, export. And this strategy is written in a language. It's not human. I would like to collaborate with Renater and I would like to send... No. You say from Renater, IS Renater, accept this or do this action extra. So this language has been specified and is put in the WIS database. So what we can do, what can do the root server is to take the information coming from the WIS database, change it into the uh, configuration file of your router. So if it's a Cisco, then you will change your RPSL routing policy specification language to iOS command. If it's a Juniper, then you will take the RPSL and we, you will compile it to create JunoS commands. If you are running uh, Linux with Quagga, you will change your, your routing policy specific language to Quagga commands, and you will put it on the server. So this way, what will do provider is just to put their policy in the with database. And with database is protected by password, so only one provider can modify its own policy. The other advantage of this is that here we are almost sure that the with database contains accurate information. Because otherwise, it's the last thing you, when you manage a network, the last thing you do is to change things in the WIS database. For example, if you look at Telecom Brotine, I think we have two directors ahead from reality. So the, we missed two directors in uh, the database, and it's still an old one that appears in the database because we forgot, or the network administrator forgot to update the WIS database. Here, you will not forget to update it because is useful for your root server. Okay? So this is one equipment you can put. The other equipment we can put not only in here, but we can also put it in the root server, is a website. Because people that, if you have a problem, for example, you, pr you don't know, you announce your prefix, but you don't know where who receive your prefix, by which path. Because you, as a nice manager, you have only a local vision of what you are doing. So you announce something to your neighbors, but you absolutely don't know how other people on Earth, other ISP on Earth, receive your announcement, and if they receive it, and in which quality, which path is selected, etc., etc. So it's good to have a vision from outside. And this vision from our side is done by some web server that can be connected to some ISP. So it can be in the global inter-exchange places or directly into the ISP network. And these equipment are called looking glass because this way you can see what happens in the network. So there is a website called bgp4.as. So AS is Assumption Island. So it's a domain that belongs to the US. But it was very funny to, uh, to put AS with BGP. So that's why they took that name. So we are going to, to see this web server. And you can learn a lot of things regarding BGP on this server. So, here you have a list of looking glass you can access. So, of course, it's a risky thing, but we are going to try to, to go through some funny places. 
let's say, United Kingdom, yeah. otherwise. Here, I am on, uh, if I select this one, and I will have an answer, I hope. Uh, I am in, uh, you see when it is end with uh, X, normally it's that we are in uh, GIX, a global exchange. So link since London uh, inter-exchange. So here I can look at some uh, looking glass. So here I take this one and I do a trust route from London to Mexico. So with, okay. So here I have my answer from London. And from here I can see the path taken from London. And you see that it looks, at the beginning it's not like what we got from France, but then I enter into level three. And when I enter into level three, then I see the, best, the same path as the one I got from, uh, from France. But what is interesting here is that, for example, you say that uh, you have a customer that says, I cannot ping a site in London on this provider. I cannot connect to this site. So you are doing a trust route, and the trust route gives you only the path to go to that site. The question is, how is the answer? Do I have a problem with the answer? So the second step is to go on the looking glass, on the path, and try to ping yourself. And this way, you will see if the return path is working. So this way, by using looking glass, you can do trust route on the other direction. Because from your computer, you can only go into one direction. So this way, you can see the return direction. So that's complete OK. And I try ITAM, trust route. See if it works. OK. So here I have the trust route from Completel. So here, timeout on the second router. And after that, I think it will be faster. OK. So here, same thing. To go to ITAM, we stay in Completel. Then we have peering with level 3. And we go to uh, ITAM. Now I can ask to show things regarding ITAM. And here it's good. You see, I give the prefix here. So it was an IP address. But in fact, in the routing table, you have a slash 22. And here I have the different paths to go to from Completel to ITAM. So the announcement is there are two paths. One is going through, uh, so 21, 200, uh, initiated by 21,520. Uh, so we can have a look to LACNIC to see if they have an answer. which is not very obvious. So it's not my best day for demos. <laughs> we'll keep it running. And we are going to see here continue. So you have this IS. So you can have a look and try to call for different ISs and see to which provider they belong to. So using the WIS command. And this way, you see that you have two routes. And if you look at this route, this one and this one, the IS path is the same. So here I'm in France, and I receive announcement from Intam, and it comes from twice the same IS path. But the router is not the same. So it comes from two routers, so two entry points on my completed network. And then, I will have to select one. Local preference is the same. And a lot of things look the same between these two announcements. So normally, what I will do is to take, for example, from my point of view, what is the closest router? 
So with the smallest IGP metric. And I will select this one. And so what we say here is that we have two available paths and the best is the number one. So I will take this entry as a next stop. And I will propagate now when I'm doing BGP announcement. I will propagate this information to over uh, IS path to over IS and tell them, look, I have this path which is the best. Extra, extra. So this is one way to do things. To log on a router using web pages. But you cannot do a lot of things when you are connected to a router. So one other solution, looking glass. So you do, I will not tell you which one you, you select. You select the one you want. So normally, if it works well, it's here. So here I'm connected in Telnet to a router. So I select France Telecom. So I am connected here, and it says that the logging air view and password is air views. So we are very nice. They gave me a password. OK. So here I will change this. I just show you here because normally you have Cisco routers. And here I am on a Juniper router. So the command line are not the same. But for example, if I type show root, I have here the routing table from this router. OK, so here I have a lot of things concerning a lot of prefixes. So I try to. So here I see, for example, prefix, all these prefixes. You see some of them are static. So it's static configuration, as we saw. But most of them are learned through BGP. So here you see that. I learned this prefix through BGP. So I can, so I will ask, give me all the routes you have learned through BGP. And here, I have all the information. So I, I know that I have learned this prefix 1.9, and this prefix 1.9 goes through this ice path. Go also this, uh, this ice path, so through another uh, default router here. So I've learned it from another router. I learned it also from this router, etc., etc. So it's all the way I learn in my France Telecom network about this prefix. And I select the first one. Here, for the other prefix, I select also this one. So now we can ask, I can type a command, show root 148.205. And here, I learn from France Telecom how I have learned in France Telecom the ETAM network. And here you have all the paths also that comes, come from France Telecom. So, of course, in each, you may, if you remember, we were in, uh, don't remember, a twin country. we. We already saw it in uh, ISPATH, I find in Hong Kong or something like this. So here it's the same, because I think here it's ITAM. And here we have something else that comes from, it, let's say, a US network, level 3. Or, no, it's not level 3, but another provider. And uh, it was uh, Betel or Betel or Bestel or something like this. And then another provider that gives me the information. Maybe level three, cable or wireless, or, or something like this. So this way you can see how you learn the information from from ETAM. So here it was Juno S. So when I do my, I, sh I show IP route on this BGP router, I get that list. And for example, here you have so slash uh, one slash eight, two slash eight, and you see that. This 1 slash 8 and 2 slash 8 have been divided in longer prefixes. And if I look at 3, 3 in fact is the first prefix that belongs to a company that was that exists before Cyber. 
And what I see here, that 3 is as this ice path. So ice path is 64, 53, etc. And the originator of this prefix is 80. So I can have a look at who is. And as, when I ask who is, it tells me that this prefix belongs to general electric. OK? So by looking to two databases, I can see that this slash 3 is announced on the network. And I know also that this prefix is initiated by AT, so general electric. Now, if I have a look on the INA web page, what do I do? I see that slash 3 slash 8 is also allocated to general electric. So here we have three kinds of database, and we see that these things are in uh, work quite, work quite ways. So if you look here, for example, we have seen in the BGP database that 1 slash 8 and 2 slash 8 didn't exist. But in fact, we had a lot of prefixes that appears in the 1 and 2 slash 8. So what we have seen in this table is that 1 slash 8 is an Asian prefix and 2 slash 8 is a ripe, so European prefix. So now, of course, we are not going to do it. If you can test it if you want. But if you look to this IS number, this IS number should be in Europe. And for the one here, this IS number should be in Asia. Etc. etc. So you here you see you have all the table, and as I said, the number of entry should be around 350,000 entries. So with which it takes a long time to view all the prefixes. So we are not going to view all of them, but we can try to filter. For example, so IP BGP 148.205.0.0. And here I have from this Canadian router prefixes and I have path here regarding ITAM prefix. So what do we see here? Is that for this prefix there is two paths. One which is composed of five IS numbers, and the other one, which is composed of four IS numbers. So if we take into account the default matrix, it's to use the shorted path, it's the shorted IS path, and it's say here that the best one is number two. So since this one is, be is number two, it means that when this router would like to send packets, or if someone in the area wants to send packet to ITAM, then the next stop will be uh, this one. So I will send the traffic outside using this one. And what you see here, that the ITAM prefix is also tagged by community attributes. So I cannot tell you what they mean. If we want to know what they mean, we have to localize and know what is this, what's the name of this IS. And then go to the web page of SIS or look at Google to find community attributes regarding this autonomous system. And they will say what means this information. But right this way, we cannot know it. So we have, to, there is no standard way, except if you find 6666, uh, that say that maybe it's to protect you from those attacks. OK, so we can also, for example, show IP, BGP, and here I can type regular expression. For example, remember, this size number is eta. So here I ask a question, and I'm going to look in all the BGP table to ask the router to show me all the paths that contain somewhere VIS number of ITAM. And if it works, it will take some time because maybe. And here, 
all these prefixes are announced by eta. So you see that here we have a lot of fragmentation of your prefix and you announce all this uh, slash 22, 24 on the network. So I have no idea why you are doing that. The best way is to ask yourself to, uh, why are you doing this on uh, ETAM network? Maybe because you have other places on, on Mexico where you use this network to do interconnection. I don't know. I will ask to, because it's, it's very strange. But you see that we have discovered this and the IS path is different. Sometimes there is problem because BZ, BGP is based on the trust from providers. So a long time ago, it was a small family and all providers were competitors for the market, but we are friends and can trust each other to exchange traffic. So there was no problem, because when you say something, of course you check it, but you cannot check everything. Because when you are a tier one, you can say, okay, I am very good to attract this traffic. And here it's very difficult to verify this kind of thing. Because you, you have to trust the other provider that tells you that he can attract the traffic. Of course, for the customer, a customer here is send you something wrong. You can suppress this announcement, but from the first level of uh, ISP, what we call the tier one, it's very difficult to do it because they can't be the best path. And if you are not the best path and you pretend to be the best path, then you can create some problem. So, there is a famous example of this kind of problem. In fact, there is two famous examples. And we are going to see the first one. The first one appears, uh, I don't remember when, but it was one or two years ago, when in Pakistan there was an attack against a mosque. Uh, and so Pakistan didn't want his uh, population to show some image on YouTube. So the idea of Pakistan, so you have YouTube that is here and is announcing its prefix to the world to of course to allow people to see video on YouTube. And here what did Pakistan Telecom is to inject YouTube prefix. In fact, YouTube, for example, is announcing, I don't remember the value we'll see that on the video, but a slash 22, and Pakistan Telecom send a slash 24, an announce for YouTube prefix as a slash 24. Which means that the longest prefix match rules makes all the traffic of the world that wanted to access YouTube to go to Pakistan. And of course, here it was a black hole because nobody can access to YouTube. So it was good for the Pakistani government because Pakistani people were not able to see YouTube video. But it was not so... People all the world thought that there was a problem because nobody can access to YouTube videos. So of course, the YouTube see immediately this kind of thing because they are already monitoring the traffic and the traffic falls down very, very quickly. So they try to change things and one temporary solution was to announce 2 slash 25 and this 2 slash 25 was, so you may put one with zero at the end and the other one with one at the end. So it's two prefixes that are better than the slash 24. And this way, they were able to attract again the traffic to their web server. So there is a video that uh, shows that. So I'm going to, to show it to you.